Welcome, everyone. I am so delighted to be here to welcome everybody who's here. And we have over 400 people registered online. So I would just like to say for everybody sitting in the seat, you're representing about 50 individuals. So if you could do it well, that would be very nice. So I am Katrina Armstrong. For those of you I haven't met, and I have the incredible privilege of being the Dean here at the Vagilis College of Physicians and Surgeons and being able to introduce our Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series. So this series was founded here in 1981, really to broaden our horizons, to bring us together in new ways to think about new fields, new ways to advance medicine and science, particularly in areas outside of our own expertise and the basic sciences and clinical sciences and humanities. So this particular lecture in the humanities has really been given by many leaders who just are household names here. Some of our leading faculty over the years, Fred Friendly, Jeff Sachs, Rita sitting here, Kelly Jones, have come and given the lecture in the Dean's Distinguished Lecture in the Humanities, really sharing with us how their work can inform our work here. But I have to say, I'm absolutely delighted that the first Dean's Distinguished Lecture in the Humanities that I get to introduce is Carol Becker. So I will say there are so many things I could say about Carol, who's a professor of the arts and Dean of the Columbia University School of the Arts. She has an extraordinary body of work that I think has really led in so many ways in defining how art leads humanity how it can be leading many of us forward at times of our greatest need. She's been in many institutes, or she's been, uh, came to Columbia, I guess I should say, from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. And as a writer and a scholar, she has talked about the role of arts in global society, feminist theory, American cultural history. But I will just say the thing that I just wanna highlight is that I joined Columbia about seven months ago, I think as many of you know. And the first time I met Carol, she just took me under her wing, showed me what it means to be part of this warm and collaborative community. She's looked out for me when I get lost across the campus. I'll see Carol saying, no, don't go in that door, it's locked. You've got to go over here. She's somebody who not only brings the sharpest of intellect, the clearest vision for what it means to be at the best of a research university, but she brings a warmth and generosity of spirit that I think defines the best of all of us. So I could not be more grateful that she is here. She'll be speaking on a topic that I couldn't be now. Um, also want to say, Carol, people are so excited about this, as you know. And Ernesto Cardinal and Thomas Merton, poets, priests, mystics, revolutionaries. So Dean Becker, thank you so much for coming. And I want to welcome you to the podium. Thank you so much, Katrina. I want to thank Katrina, Dean, and she has so many titles. <laughs> you do. Uh, Dean and Chief Executive Officer of Irving Medical Center and the Vagilis College of Physicians and Surgeons. Those are just two. Uh, Dr. Rita Sharon, who is going to be here and uh, handling the questions, Executive Director of Columbia Narrative Medicine, Chair of Medical Humanities and Ethics, and Clara Leone is Director of CUIMC Events and Christina Vague, Associate Director of CUIMC Events. I wanna say that it's been a wonderful, wonderful time working with all of you. This is such a professional, fantastic environment. Ann Thornton, Vice Provost and uh, University Librarian, Columbia University. Jennifer Lee, Curator, Rare Books and Manuscripts. Sandra Alita, the estate of John Howard Griffin. You're gonna see some images that they let us use today. Holly Dankert is Head of Research, at School of the Art Institute of Chicago also an archivist, we have some images from them. Eve Glassberg, who is uh, officer of Columbia University Communications and Public Affairs. And of course, Gavin Browning, director of public programs and engagement for the Columbia University School of the Arts, who's helped me in every way with this piece, research, images. And I'm just gonna jump in because I'm trying to keep very closely to the time I've been allotted. So this is a piece about two courageous radical thinkers who lived in the spirit of history and were committed to healing the individual 
and the society through contemplation and action. And I'm going to dedicate this lecture whoever, to all who try to live courageously each day, and especially to those at Columbia's Medical Center and at the Vagilis College of Physicians and Surgeons who did not hesitate to risk everything to care for as many as possible during the early days of the pandemic. This is dedicated to all of you. I begin with a quote from T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets from the Dry Sauvage. We cannot think of a time that is oceanless or of an ocean not littered with wastage or of a future that is not liable like the past to have no destination. T.S. Eliot wrote those lines in 1941 during the Blitz in London. The world surely looked dark to everyone at that time and it was hard to envision a future. There are days now when it is also difficult to imagine what will come next for democracy, for those living in the turmoil of forced migration, the ravages of war, racial or gender-based violence, and for all experiencing the extreme conditions of climate change while navigating an ongoing and ever evolving pandemic. How do we think about the world moving forward and determine our own actions in accordance? And how do we integrate the private sphere, which has become too public with the public sphere, which at times has become too private and which at other moments seems non-existent? Where and to whom do we look for an integration of such complexity and the hopefulness needed to imagine what does not as yet exist. And if our imaginations and will are strong enough, how then do we bring the newly imagined into existence? It is in this spirit of such inquiry that I return to the life and work of Ernesto Cardinal and Thomas Merton. I knew Cardinal personally and had studied his work. I also knew the writings of Thomas Merton but I was unaware of their lifelong friendship and correspondence until I visited the Rare Books and Manuscripts 2015 exhibition at Columbia's Butler Library, Season of Celebration, Thomas Merton at 100. And there for the first time, I learned about the deep connection between these two priests, poets, monks, mystics, artists, and activists. I then became focused on how their lives and work embodied their deepest values allowed for their need for silence and contemplation while turning their creative efforts out towards transforming society in order to satisfy a shared love for the world. There is much to be learned from how they worked for social change in spite of and because of the contradictory forces they struggled to reconcile. Cardinal was a true revolutionary who engaged in the overthrow of the Somoza family dictatorship, which had terrorized Nicaragua for four decades and was finally overthrown by the Sandinista National Liberation Front in 1979. The Sandinistas were originally a progressive guerrilla movement greatly influenced by the Cuban revolution. Cardinal served as Nicaraguan cultural minister under the Sandinista government from 1979 to 1988. Merton was a contemplative who although sequestered for most of his adult life was nonetheless in an ongoing conversation with a very expansive world through his many books, essays, and letters, he attempted to define for himself and others what it meant to live as an activist monk. And both Cardinal and Merton had religious epiphanies after which they chose to live within the structures of the church, although they each also spent their lives struggling against these confinements. They both had enormous curiosity and pursued the world. Cardinal traveled extensively and purposefully within the indigenous cultures of Latin America and the US, Merton studied Gandhism and nonviolent resistance, as well as Buddhist and Zen traditions of the East. And when finally given permission, traveled to meet the Dalai Lama and other spiritual leaders to learn about Tibetan meditation. Each found liberated landscapes for their experimental ideas in writing. And their correspondence of 92 letters attest to the companionship they offered each other as poets, translators, editors, priests, visionaries and friends. Their stories can be told separately, but also together. Let's begin with Cardinal. Who was Ernesto Cardinal? Ernesto Cardinal was born in Granada, Nicaragua to a wealthy family. He became one of Latin American's most important poets. Before he even met Merton, 
he was already quite literally following in his footsteps. Cardinal knew that Merton had studied at Columbia University, so he also enrolled at Columbia, and from 1948 to 49, studied North American literature. In 1957, after he experienced an intense religious conversion, Cardinal followed Merton to the Catholic monastery known as the Abbey of Our Lady of Gethsemane. Founded in 1848 and located in Kentucky, it housed the Order of Cistercians of the Strict Observance, better known as Trappists, whose members vowed to speak only when absolutely necessary. Merton, who by then had become a priest at Gethsemane and had taken a vow to remain at this abbey for his entire life, was already serving as novice mentor. Thus, when Cardinal arrived at Gethsemane, Merton soon became his spiritual advisor. Cardinal emerged, imagined that Gethsemane would be the ideal place, place to study for the priesthood, but the rigors of intense physical labor, the commitment to silence, as well as the restrictions on the type of writing Cardinal could practice as a novitiate were too arduous and restrictive for him. And during his time there, he suffered a lot of anxiety, as well as chronic migraines and disorders of the stomach, and although he later wrote wistfully about how the, how the silence at Gethsemane had brought him peace, his experience was actually stressful. So much so that Merton advised him to leave the order to protect his health. Merton believed that some of Cardinal's ailments were caused by, quote, suppressing the desire to write poetry. Cardinal then went to study at a Benedictine monastery in Cuernavaca, Mexico, and by then, the two men had become good friends and together dreamt of establishing new reimagined spiritual communities in Nicaragua and in Mexico that also would include artists and campesinos. But when they could not get approval to actualize these plans, Cardinal continued his studies in La Seca, Colombia, and later returned to Nicaragua to be ordained as a priest in 1965. Drawn to Marxism, as his way of manifesting the gospel in the world, Cardinal visited Cuba in 1970, where he embraced the concepts of revolution about which he said, revolution draws us near to God. The real revolution is the gospel put into practice, giving food to the hungry, home, education, health, everything to those who have nothing. At that time, he also became a proponent of liberation theology, a radical Christian movement then powerful in Latin America that emphasized liberation for all from social, political, and economic oppression. Who was Thomas Merton? Thomas Merton spent most of his childhood in the French Pyrenees with his artist father, and then also in Queens. His mother had died when he was six years old. He went on to Cambridge, where for a time he lived a stormy, raucous life, expelled from Cambridge, he was sent to the US to study at Columbia University, and there he found an intellectual home. Merton wrote, in my senior year at Columbia, things got straight. He found his calling as a writer and was editor of the 1937 yearbook, as well as art editor of the humor magazine called The Jester. At that time, although quite surprising to his friends, he also experienced a religious conversion, eventually leading him to the Abbey of Gethsemane, it was there that he wrote and then published The Seven Story Mountain, his spiritual autobiography, that arriving as it did right after World War II, remarkably became a bestseller, providing a spiritual renewal for many readers who had lived through the war and its unspeakable atrocities. Merton went on to write and edit 70 more books about religion, the cloistered life, contemplation, Zen Buddhism, Taoism, and other Eastern forms of meditation and thought and as a powerful and consistent anti-war, anti-violence, anti-nuclear pro-civil rights advocate, he wrote many essays addressing the contemporary political situation. At times, his political writing was censored by the abbot at Gethsemane. And although living in an austere Christian environment, he was told that he must not write about nuclear war or be an advocate for peace, a censor he, exper she, he experienced as an enormous contradiction. Through his writing, he became friends and correspondents with an international world of spiritual, cultural, and political leaders, including the Dalai Lama, the Vietnamese pacifist monk Thich Nhat Hanh, poet John Berrigan, Joan Baez, Evelyn Waugh, Henry Miller, Boris Pasternak, 
Shizlo Miwash, D.T. Suzuki, and many more. Merton believed that the contemplative life in its way was also an activist life. In Bangkok, during his last lecture and right before his death, to an international audience of abbots, he said, the monk belongs to the world, but the world also belongs to him insofar as he has dedicated himself totally to liberation from it in order to liberate it. Neither Merton nor Cardinal saw philosophical contradictions between their contemplative religious commitments and their political activist ones, but others surely did. The scolding. In 1983, Pope John Paul II came to Nicaragua. His decision to visit a new now socialist government was surprising given his conservative and well-known antipathies for socialism, communism, liberation theology, and the involvement of priests in government, particularly in revolutionary governments. All the more reason why his arrival was greatly anticipated and therefore interpreted by the Sandinistas as an important public acknowledgement of their government. The day the Pope was to arrive from Rome, Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega waited on the tarmac for him to arrive. He then escorted the Pope to the receiving line where Ines the Cardinal and three other priests who had participated in the revolution and now held government positions were waiting to greet him. These priests already had been reprimanded by the Pope and told that they must leave their posts or risk being in violation of canonical law because in holding public office, they were acting ad divinias, in other words, beyond the divine ministries. In a video news clip of this event, we observe Nicaraguan president Daniel Ortega leading the Pope towards Cardinal, who is dressed in his usual white peasant shirt, jeans and Che Guevara beret. As the Pope approaches, Cardinal smiles, kneels and looks up to him, but the Pope does not extend his hand or allow Cardinal to kiss his ring. Rather, the Pope reprimands Cardinal, waving his finger as he tells him in Spanish, you must add Aguilar, you must adjust your relationship with the church. And some months later, Cardinal and the other priests on the tarmac were told that they could no longer offer priestly blessings or administer the sacraments of baptism, holy communion, confession, marriage, or last rites. And in 1985, Cardinal was officially defrocked. Nonetheless, he continued to serve as minister of culture until 1988, when extremely critical of the Sandinista government, which he then believed to be a quote, dictatorship, not a revolutionary movement, he resigned his government position. Now the clip. Siempre te digo que era una visita pastoral, que es una diferencia o una visita de gobierno, jefe de Estado. Aún así, toda la Junta de Gobierno de Reconstrucción Nacional y Dirección del FSLN asistió. Y para sorpresa de todos, en televisión abierta, el Papa Juan Pablo II reprende a uno de los miembros del gabinete. Era el padre Ernesto Cardenal, ministro de Cultura. De Ernesto Cardenal se dijo que no iba a estar, pero él a la última hora apareció ahí, entonces. Now an interlude. Cardenal comes to Chicago at my invitation. During this time, I was chair of the graduate division at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and had invited Cardinal to do a formal reading of his poetry. Almost two years after I sent the invitation, Cardinal responded to the cultural ministry at the Nicaraguan embassy to say that he was quite pleased to be invited as a poet and would be arriving in a month to stay for a week. This was now 1985, and by then Nicaragua was much in the US news. President Jimmy Carter had supported the Sandinistas and had even invited them to the White House but when Ronald Reagan became president in 1981, he began a covert and overt war against Nicaragua, blocking their loan requests from the World Bank. He also mounted a counter-revolutionary movement by a group called the Contras. The Iran-Contra scandal occurred during Reagan's second term when officials secretly facilitated the sale of arms to the Khomeini government of Iran, which at the time was the subject of an arms embargo. The administration hoped to use the money made from these illicit arms sales to fund the overthrow of the Nicaraguan government by the Contras. This was an illegal action because further funding of the Contras had already been prohibited by Congress. So as the United States sought to protect its investments in Latin America, Cold War fear 
of Soviet involvement was being fomented, which led to the anxiety of the domino effect, whereby in this imagining, all of Latin America would inevitably fall to communism. So my once rather benign invitation for Cardinal to come read his poetry in Chicago now took on a new intense political signification that I surely had not anticipated. Now at that stage of my career, I had little experience hosting such a dignified and now extremely controversial guest. Luckily for me, Harold Washington had been elected mayor of Chicago, the first black mayor of Chicago, and several of my close friends held important positions in his administration, which gave me access to much needed assistance. But everyone I spoke to about this upcoming event agreed that first I needed to talk to the legendary Monsignor Jack Egan. John Joseph Egan, or Monsignor Egan, was a much beloved progressive anti-racist activist priest who had marched with Martin Luther King from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. And when I met him in the 1980s, he taught at DePaul University and also served as special advisor to the president of the university while presiding over Holy Name Cathedral, the seat of the archdiocese, one of the largest Roman Catholic dioceses in the United States. Jack Egan was much influenced by Saul Alinsky, whose progressive community organizing strategies were also very formative for President Barack Obama, who often cites Alinsky in relationship to his own work as a community organizer. At that time in Chicago church hierarchy, Jack Egan was second only to Cardinal Joseph Bernadine, who had recently been elevated to the Cardinalate by none other than John Paul II. When I called Jack Egan's office at DePaul University and spoke to his devoted chief of staff, I told her about Ernesto Cardinal's upcoming visit, which was my purpose in wanting to meet with Monsignor Egan. And she then arranged a dinner for us on the far west side of Chicago in one of Chicago's oldest Italian restaurants. And because I had seen images of Jack Egan in the press for years, I immediately recognized him at the restaurant, seated in a large Norga Hyde corner booth. He was a small Irish American man then in his 60s with wire rimmed glasses, a black mock turtleneck sweater and sports jacket. He was not wearing a Roman collar or any other identifying clerical garment. And I asked him why he had chosen a restaurant so far from the city center and far from where we both lived. And he told me that it was difficult for him to find any anonymity in Chicago. When he had dinner with a friend and especially a woman friend, there were always those who, because they resented his progressive politics, hoped to defame him in any way they could. But he often came to this West Side restaurant because the owners neither made a fuss about him nor seemed concerned about who he was dining with. Several important things came from that first meeting with Monsignor Egan, who right from the start asked me to call him Jack. And he suggested that we plan a fundraiser for Cardinal's art community in Solentaname, Nicaragua, and that we approach the Crowleys, a very well-known progressive Catholic family in Chicago to host this event at their downtown apartment which had spectacular views of Lake Michigan, and Jack offered to ask them himself. During this first conversation, he also inquired about my own religious background. I told him that my mother was Polish Catholic and my father was Russian Jewish. And you, he inquired, what religion are you? This made me anxious because I did not want him to interpret my response as flippant or vague, but nonetheless, I told him the truth. I am both and neither. As a child, I sometimes went to church but more often I went to synagogue where I still go on high holy days, but I never committed to one religion over the other. And now I study Buddhism. He listened intently as priests are trained to do and then surprised me by saying, this upbringing in two powerful cultures and religions is your great strength and your gift. You can talk to anyone, be with and work with anyone. So instead of offending him, my unorthodox upbringing intrigued him and it surprised me that he recognized this ecumenical attribute in my nature so quickly and so positively. Meeting Jack Egan was my first entree into the amazing world of progressive priests and nuns in Chicago. Our conversations and our friendship would deepen until his death in 2001, when I attended his memorial service at Holy Name Cathedral, along with thousands of other Chicagoans of multiple faiths, classes, races, and political persuasions many of whom, of whom considered Jack Egan, as I did, a close friend. As I said, by 1985, the US had been thrown back into Cold War rhetoric and the overt fear of communism. And because Cardinal Visit was now coinciding with this escalation, 
Cardinal had become an easy target for right-wing aggression. The Sandinista government made it clear that we needed professional security to protect Cardinal as he moved around Chicago. Soon, the coalition that I was forming would include a group I much admired, but until that time had never personally encountered, the Chicago chapter of the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, the VVAW. Many of us who protested the Vietnam War recognized that those veterans who opposed the war were the most courageous. I had seen the documentary film which featured the Winter Soldier investigation held from late January to early February, 1971. It was a convocation sponsored by the Vietnam Veterans Against the War in which discharged servicemen from each branch of the armed services, as well as civilian contractors, medical personnel and academics gave testimony about the brutality of the Vietnam War from 1963 to 1970. And some of these veterans now were serving as security for progressive political figures such as Cardinal. When I called the chapter, Chicago chapter, they sent a contingent to meet with me, including their leader, Bill Bramson. And I was immediately impressed with the seriousness and focus with which they took this request. I ended up learning so much from this devoted group about what it takes to protect a public figure in a city like Chicago. We were told that Cardinal would arrive from Washington with poet Roberta Vargas, then cultural and labor affairs attache for the Nicaraguan embassy. And Vargas would serve as Cardinal's translator for the poetry reading and help secure his safety. Also arriving with them would be Cardinal's personal bodyguard. Of course, we imagined that he would be a strapping figure and were quite taken aback when a very slight thin man came out of the plane with Cardinal, a handgun on his belt. Roberta Vargas introduced him to us as the bravest fighter in the overthrow of the Somoza dictatorship. He was entrusted with Cardinal's life, and now so were we. Nena Torres, then director of the First Commission on Latino Affairs under Harold Washington, and her husband, Matt Pierce, who served as corporation counsel for the city, generously volunteered the guest room on the north side of Chicago as a place where Cardinal could stay for a week. And we agreed that one VVAW guard would always be outside their home at night watching the entrance from a car while another secured the rear. And as promised, Jack Egan had helped organize a reception at the Crowley's. This late afternoon fundraising event was filled with sympathetic nuns and priests, as well as lay supporters of the Sandinistas, then still considered a very progressive force for change in Nicaragua. And on that day, while Cardinal and I waited in a small room for all to arrive, I soon began to see how shy Cardinal was and how much drain it was for him to speak to large groups. Roberta Vargas often reminded me that although Cardinal was revolutionary, he was also a monk and a poet who needed contemplative time. But Cardinal was a very committed political activist who understood that he could not separate himself from his very visible position and its demands. So honoring his need for solitude, I left Cardinal and waited expectantly in the hallway of the Crowley apartment for Jack Egan to arrive. Once off the elevator, Jack took my arm and I escorted him into the apartment where by then many were gathered. When we walked into the living room, Cardinal was surrounded by admiring priests and nuns. I had already briefed Cardinal about Monsignor Egan and I was honored to introduce them to each other. But when Jack entered the room, the room suddenly became silent and the guests moved aside, allowing him to approach Cardinal. And once in front of Cardinal, Jack unexpectedly lowered himself and knelt before him. He then took Cardinal's hand and placed it on his own head and asked Cardinal to offer him a blessing. Everyone inhaled at once and the space around these two giants contracted. This group well understood that the Pope recently had taken away Cardinal's right to officiate such priestly acts. And Jack's request was a public rebuke of the church's authority and therefore enormously subversive. At first, Cardinal refused to comply, but Jack said quietly and firmly that he would not stand up until Cardinal offered him a blessing. And by now, some of us were holding hands and many were in tears. After a time, Cardinal relented and we all released our breath. A great deal of money was raised at that event. Cash and checks flowed from everyone, even those who had little to give. People had come prepared to make an offering 
to Cardinal's visionary community of artists, priests, and campesinos in Solentiname. Patty Crowley put all the money collected into a big brown envelope and proudly handed it to Cardinal. And he, Roberto Vargas, his bodyguard, our VVAW security and I, then headed for dinner at a Mexican restaurant in Chicago's Pilsen neighborhood, whose tortillerias and bodegas and murals always reminded me of Mexico City. And it was a place where I knew Cardinal would feel at home. We took two cars, Cardinal, his bodyguard and I were in the back seat of one with a VVAW guard driving and Roberto Vargas in the front passenger seat. The rest of our security team followed closely behind and both cars headed south on Lakeshore Drive. We were all quite jolly at the restaurant, relieved that it had gone so well. Cardinal was very pleased to have raised thousands of dollars for his Solentinami community. And of course, we talked about Jack Egan's amazing gesture. Cardinal ate with gusto, but he noted as he had before that I barely ate anything. You will eat again when I am gone, he said. And he was correct. During the week he spent in Chicago in our care, I was way too anxious to eat. Finally, we piled into the cars and headed north again up Lakeshore Drive so Cardinal could retreat to his room at Matinanas for the night. But when we were almost downtown, halfway to our destination, Cardinal said in a very calm voice, I left the envelope with the money under my seat in the restaurant. We need to go back. No one said a word. Our VVAW driver simply got off Lakeshore Drive at the next exit. The other car followed. The drivers made a loop and headed south again, but this time going as fast as permitted. When we arrived at the restaurant, Roberto Vargas jumped out of the car, ran inside and returned in minutes, waving the envelope triumphantly above his head. And back in the car, we all began to talk at once. I asked Cardinal if he had been anxious as we drove to the restaurant in silence. No, he said, I was praying. We probably all were doing the same. I marveled at the composure of this group. No one panicked, at least not overtly. No one reprimanded anyone else. If you had to be in a tense situation, these were the people to be with. They already had been through so much. Cardinal had helped make a revolution. And although he was a pacifist, there had been violence, much violence. His bodyguard had fought in that same struggle as had Roberto Vargas. The VVAW guardians had witnessed terrifying things in Vietnam. Everyone in that car with me was familiar with adversity, stress, and the need for miracles. And I simply took my cues from them. The reading. As the media heated up about Cardinal's reading with an anticipated crowd of a thousand that would fill the auditorium, the administration of the Art Institute, whom I had cleared the invitation with sometimes before, now became nervous. The VVAW in particular advised even greater security for this big event. Cardinal had spent the week meeting with several Nicaraguan support groups and church leaders, and he also had received an award from Comité Latino for his contribution to culture at the same event that Mayor Howard Washington had received an award for his executive order to remove questions about citizenship from city job applications. And because of the embargo, the Contras, the US supported attempts to overthrow a legitimately elected Nicaraguan government and an ingrained American anti-communist sentiment the reading had become a complex cultural event that easily could have become a political embroglio. There were those who thought bringing a self-declared Marxist to Chicago was a type of heresy. And on May 13th, 1985, nasty gossip columnist Sneed at the Chicago Sun-Times wrote, quote, eyebrows at City Hall were raised Friday when Maria Torres, Nena, executive director of the Mayor's Latino Advisory Commission was seen shuttling around Ernesto Cardinal the Nicaraguan head of cultural affairs. They aren't on our side, are they? Sneed wrote. And the May 10th, 1985 Chicago Sun-Times article entitled Radical Priests to Read Poetry by Peggy Constantine read, the invitation to Cardinal was an impetuous gesture by Carol Becker, Dean of Graduate Studies at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, who was a fan of Cardinal's poetry. Becker sent the invitation 18 months ago. His acceptance came only last month. Becker said, he is coming as a poet, not as a political speaker. Of course, Cardinal did not separate these identities, nor did his audience, and nor did I. But it also was true that at the big public event, he was not going to advocate for the Sandinistas, the revolution, or even for his intentional community in Solentinami. He had been invited to read from his many books of poetry to those who admired his work, and that is what he did. And on the big night, thanks to my friends in city government, we had police and police cars guarding the museum. 
All who attended were required to open their bags and purses before they could enter, a precaution that was not yet as ubiquitous as it is now. There were BBAW guardians positioned every few feet along the sides of Rublev Auditorium, and there were more guards next to Cardinal on stage. I came out first to introduce Cardinal, who looked dramatic in all white and wearing a black beret, and he read in Spanish. Roberto Vargas read the English translations. Cardinal's intentness and humility were obvious, endearing and contagious. The poetry, especially his poem, Prayer for Marilyn Monroe, written after her death, made the crowd go wild. And from the moment he began reading, the audience was up on its feet, applauding this extraordinary man who was a poet, a priest, a mystic, a government appointed cultural minister, and always, always by his own definition, a revolutionary. Cardinal is poet. Cardinal was the recipient of many prizes for his writing, including the French Legion of Honor, the Reina Sofia Prize for Latin American Poetry, and the Pablo Neruda Prize. And in 2005, he was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature. His large body of writing includes 15 books of poetry translated into English and Dutch, German, French, and equivalent number still to be translated. He studied many North American poets of the previous generations, such as Walt Whitman, Robinson Jeffers, William Carlos Williams, but he insisted that his greatest influence was Ezra Pound. His work was also greatly formed by voices of his own generation, including Allen Ginsberg, Gary Snyder, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Denise Levertov, and of course, Thomas Merton. Cardinal's poetry is an interweaving of images from North American popular culture, reflections on the contemporary and global political world, allusions to Latin American poetry, Amerindian creation myths, Catholic iconography, Nicaraguan history, particle physics, quantum physics, physics, evolutionary biology, the wisdom of many spiritual traditions, including Zen and Zen Buddhism, and the subtleties of love. But all come together in his magnum opus, Cosmic Canticle, which playwright Harold Pinter called an extraordinary achievement. In that epic poem, Cardinal attempts to locate himself, the earth, and poetry within the complexities of science and the mysteries of the universe. And in one of his last books, The Origin of Species, he makes clear that he sees no contradiction between a belief in God and a belief in evolution. One of Cardinal's most poignant poems was written after he was notified of Merton's death. Because Merton died in Bangkok and there was no autopsy, there have been some who have questioned how Merton died. Investigative reporters have attempted to prove that Merton was murdered by the CIA because of his anti-war writings and advocacy. There are others who believe his death might have been a suicide. I have accepted the official explanation because it is what Cardinal appears to believe and how he alludes to this event in his own writing. Merton had traveled to India to meet with the Dalai Lama and other Tibetan Buddhists. He then went on to Thailand to give a major lecture at a convocation of abbots in Bangkok on December 10th, 1968. As he finished his lecture, in the afternoon, assuming he would take questions about his lecture in the evening, he said prophetically, now I shall disappear. It is believed that Merton then 53, returned to his lodgings at the retreat center and while coming out of the shower barefoot and with the floor perhaps still wet, he reached to adjust a standing electric fan which short circuited and fatally electrocuted him, also throwing him onto the floor where he hit his head. His chest was burned when they found him by the flames from the fan, which then fell on top of him, the blades still spinning. He was then brought back to the US in a military plane, returning from Vietnam, a final irony, given his strong anti-Vietnam War sentiments in writing. And before he left for Asia, he had written to Cardinal that he wanted to extend his trip to the Himalayas and also that he hoped to see Cardinal in early January, 1969, Though he wrote, something else might happen to delay me, as tragically it did. The title of Cardinal's poem, Coplas on the Death of Merton, is a direct allusion to a very famous 15th century work by Jorge Manrique that is translated as Verses on the Death of His Father. In this poem, Cardinal addresses Merton as Tom, Merton's secular and writing name. At Gethsemane, he was known as Father Lewis. The poem is an invocation of the minute particulars of their friendship, and it brings together their shared critique of media and its effects on society, their deep knowledge of contemporary poetry, Amerindian mythology, Buddhism, 
Catholicism and allusion to Merton's books and many translations of Eastern philosophy. But mostly the poem reflects their questioning of what is under, above, and around everything. Is there something? Is there nothing? Is there light? Is there darkness? It reveals their intimacy as friends, fellow priests, and writers. And in the poem, Cardinal speaks directly to Merton as if Merton were still close to him listening. I'm gonna read a few excerpts from this poem and Cardinal, please forgive me for excerpting and disrupting your perfect verse. The poem opens and later repeats and closes with the same three lines as the 15th century poem, which also begins, our lives are rivers that go to empty into the sea that is life. Your rather funny death, Merton, or absurd like a koan, your general electric brand death, and the corpse back to the USA in an army plane, with that sense of humor so much your own, you must have laughed. You, Merton, now corpseless, dying of laughter. I did too. One more afternoon dies over Selentinami, Tom. These sacred waters sparkle, and little by little, they go out. It's time to light the Coleman lamp. All joy is union. Sorrow is to be without the others. Western Union, the cablegram from the Abbot of Gethsemane was yellow. We regret to inform you, etc. I just said, okay. To die is not to leave this world. It is to plunge into it. You are in the hidden part of the universe, the underground, outside the establishment of this world, outside of time space, without Johnson or Nixon. There are no tigers there, say the Malays an island of the West that go to empty into the sea, that is life. Much of the conversation between Merton and Cardinal in the early letters is about their shared desire to create a reimagined spiritual community in Latin America, which they believed was much needed. They both were early global thinkers interested in bringing the knowledge of the Northern and Southern hemispheres together. But because Merton's original vow was to remain at Gethsemane for his lifetime, leaving the monastery, even for a few years, what is called exclaustration, required permission from the abbot and perhaps even from the Pope. But in 1966, when it seemed very clear that neither the abbot nor the Pope would allow Merton to leave, Cardinal activated their initial vision for an intentional contemplative community on his own. And this community later would also include artists Cardinal himself was also a sculptor, poets, students, campesinos, and fishermen in a remote archipelago on Lake Nicaragua called Solentiname. At this time, Merton was still intent on gaining permission to join Cardinal and archived with the Cardinal papers at the University of Texas, Austin is a letter that Merton wrote to Pope John Paul II addressed, Most Holy Father. It alerts the Pope that a contingent of Latin American priests is on its way to Rome to meet with him to plead Merton's case to serve as spiritual father for this newly formed community in Salentiname. It is not clear whether the Pope ever saw that letter or received this special envoy in person, but it is apparent that Merton did not feel he could leave Gethsemane without the Pope's blessing. Perhaps John, Pope John Paul II and the Abbot of Gethsemane both understood that Merton was too great an asset to the Trappists to allow him to leave the monastery, even for a time. Merton's many books, especially Seven Story Mountain, were very significant in making the lives of the Trappists visible and comprehensible to a lay readership. The writing also proved extremely lucrative, not for Merton, of course, who had taken a vow of poverty, but for the monastery at Gethsemane, which received all his royalties. Another speculation was that the church did not approve of what they called special friendships exclusive closeness between priests. There was always an unspoken underlying fear of homosexuality, even though there is absolutely no evidence that the friendship between Merton and Cardinal ever had such components. In fact, much has been written about Merton's love for women, which caused many problems for him in his youth and almost propelled him to leave the monastery more than once, including right before his final journey to Asia when he had fallen in love with a nurse who was caring for him in the hospital. Cardinal's poems often allude to the women he had loved when he was young and the images of their beauty that haunted him still. 
But this conservative Pope might also have feared that were Merton to live in Latin America, he might embrace and therefore legitimate liberation theology to his very large following. In any case, the Merton Cardinal friendship and the potential loss of Merton to Gethsemane caused so much anxiety for the church that Merton was even discouraged from continuing his correspondence with Cardinal, a correspondence which was read by the censors that were later renamed the readers. This correspondence, which originated with Merton advising Cardinal about what was termed conscious matters, an extension of his spiritual mentorship, later became a predominantly literary correspondence, especially after their aspirations for a new type of spiritual community were squelched. Then the tone and subject matter of the letters becomes less personal and, were, and becomes predominantly filled with specific details about their writing, translations, and literary opportunities. They were well aware that their letters were being read and even that some were perhaps kept from them. Gethsemane had made Merton, had been Merton's protector and oppressor. When he was not allowed to travel, he wrote in his journal, this is an imprisonment which I accept with total freedom. Gethsemane is where he had become a writer and conversed with the world through his books and his intense correspondence. In his journals, Merton also expressed his own ambivalence about leaving Gethsemane. He was not sure whether Nicaragua would prove too challenging for him, both physically and psychically. He did have many ongoing health issues, but he also feared he would be perceived as a North American or as a gringo tourist, as he said. But living in such an intentionally political community as Salentaname might have given Merton an opportunity to engage the world in direct action, which he deeply craved. The last lecture Merton delivered right before his death begins by referencing the work of Herbert Marcuse, my mentor at the University of California, San Diego. And in this talk, Merton attempts to advise his audience of abbots and monks living close to Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos about the necessity to understand Marxism and its relationship to spirituality. He references Marcuse's then much discussed book, One Dimensional Man, so his audience might begin to understand the revolutionary potential of culture. Merton also was always interested in how to transform the monastic world, which he often found ill-suited to deep contemplation. He did strongly believe that monks could be active in the world and still not be of the world, but he clearly openly struggled with the life he had chosen and the vows he had taken. He also worried that he was out of touch with contemporary society and often out of touch with himself as well. In order to go deeper into his own meditation, he sought permission for an even more isolated retreat on Gethsemane's and grounds. And once granted, he called his new private space of contemplation, the Hermitage. Cardinal, however, was considered a secular priest without a designated order, but he too was never able to really leave the church. No matter how much the church denounced his actions, it remained his spiritual home. And in 1994, Cardinal did, however, unequivocally separate himself from the Sandinistas after their politics became completely contrary to what he perceived as Christian values. And at that time, and to this day, the Sandinistas tragically have become overtly fascist, killing and incarcerating outspoken priests and campesinos. When Cardinal did denounce the Sandinistas, his life then became endangered, and he was forever called a traitor by their supporters, 100 of whom even attacked his coffin at his funeral. Fighting for those who have the least and are ignored or exploited by governments is of course a political act, but for Cardinal, it was always also a spiritual act. He felt the urgency of recognizing the needy and aligning himself with those who suffer most, employing whatever tactics were necessary to create a just society. This for him was the true interpretation of the gospels. In 2019, when Cardinal was dying, he asked to be reinstated as a priest. He believed the election of Pope Francis was a miracle and hoped that Francis would overturn his predecessor's ruling against him. And he solicited Nicaraguan Archbishop Somertag to intercede. And on February 17, 2020, the Archbishop conveyed Pope Francis's decision to allow Cardinal once again to administer his priestly duties. And in the hospital in Managua, right before his death, Cardinal was able to officiate Holy Mass with Archbishop Summertag, and this was Cardinal's first Eucharistic celebration in more than 30 years, and he died soon after on March 1st, 2020. In 1993,
Cardinal published a book of transcribed, of transcribed gospel discussions that he had led with the peasant community of Solentaname. And this book has been translated into many languages and studied throughout the world. And in his preface, Cardinal writes that every Sunday in Solentaname, instead of a sermon, we held a dialogue on the gospel readings. Passages were read aloud so that both literate and illiterate community members were able to participate in the conversations and offer their interpretations. Cardinal believed that the dialogues about the gospels led by the campesinos, quote, were even more profound than those of many theologians and reflected the simplicity of the gospel readings themselves. He also wrote, the gospel teaches us that the word of God is not only to be heard, but to be put into practice. Salan Tanami existed for 11 years and was destroyed in 1977 by Samosa's army, which ultimately was defeated by the Sandinistas, comprised of many members of the Solentaname community who had become revolutionaries. But when the dictator Samosa was finally overthrown in 1979 and forced to flee his bunker, he had left behind a copy of Cardinal's book, The Gospel in Solentaname. There on the dictator's night table, writes Cardinal, among the passages that Samosa had underlined was a gospel interpretation by a young campesino who had said, that King Herod must have felt hatred and envy because dictators have always believed they were gods. They think they are the only ones and cannot allow anyone to be above them. Samosa had probably recognized himself in that description. Merton imagined a sequestered life where he could practice deep contemplation whose effects would transform him and then reverberate out to the world. Cardinal dreamed of changing society through revolution and culture and of building just and equitable communities like Solentinami. Both were activists, also committed to very traditional, and in Merton's case, extreme religious practices that structured, contained, enriched, but also restricted their lives. Perhaps for both, it was actually the daily practice of writing that allowed them to bring the complexities and contradictions of Catholicism, Buddhism, indigenous knowledge, Marxism, revolution, evolution, and social justice together. Without this commitment to writing, they might never have been able to sustain a lifetime of creative work. And of course, it was their unique friendship that propelled an ongoing search for what a Solentiname Campesino called the spirit of the future society. In this final excerpt at the end of Coplas for the death of Thomas Merton, Cardinal speaks directly and often ironically to Merton. He also mentions their friend, the famous Chilean poet, Nicano Para, and also Merton's many translations of Asian philosophers with names very difficult for a Western audience to pronounce. He also alludes to the fact that when alive, Merton never was permitted to come to Solentiname. The authorities said it was not practical. But now in his bodiless state, perhaps he is finally there. Cardinal writes, at last you came to Solentiname which wasn't practical. After the Dalai Lama and the Himalayas with their buses painted like dragons in the uncanny aisles, you are here with your silent tzus and fus, kung tzu, le tzu, meng tzu, tu fu, and ikanapara, and everywhere as simple to communicate with you as with God or as difficult. Like the whole cosmos in a drop of dew this morning on the way to the privy. Elijah snatched away by the chariot of cosmic energy. And in the Papuan tribe, when they saw the telegraph, they made a tiny model of it so they could talk with the dead. The Celts used to lend money, says Valerius Maximus, to be paid beyond the grave. All the kisses given or not given, that's why the swans sing, said Socrates. Upon your chest, the fan still turning. We love or are only when we die, the great final act, the gift of one's whole being. Okay, thank you. Dean Beckford, thank you so very much for those truly beautiful words. I think we're all gonna reflect for some time 
uh, it's an incredible moment, I think, as we look around us to understand that type of connection, perseverance and beauty as they brought to the world. So we perhaps do not have that level of beauty, but I do have a small crystal. <laughs> perfect, yes, that's perfect. So we have a wonderful award that we are giving you here Aww. in honor of your Dean's Distinguished Lecture in Humanities, which means so very much to us. I didn't know I was getting an award. Oh, yeah, beautiful. it is. I want you a little closer to the I, I need an award. I need an award. <laughs> Wonderful. And now we're going to invite, Rita's been monitoring the questions. She's going to come up and play the MC for questions. So thank you again, Carol. Rita, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Rita. Thank you. Two buddies. Yes. <laughs> yes, but Carol, Carol, all of us have witnessed a love story. <laughs> we have witnessed the love story of these two men and their faith behind them, but mediated through your discovery of their written correspondence. Do you see how intricate, and we all are following this, we're, we're listening to her words, echoing their words, and their words making this not just love story, but story of revolution and freedom. So it's an incredible journey you just brought us on. And we owe you a great, great deal. It's the journey I've been on writing it, you know? That's why I got so intrigued by it. But I I wasn't sure anybody else would be intrigued with me. So thank you. Wow. <laughs> now we have, we have a few minutes for questions before we uh, uh, join our reception outside. Um, and I will start by inviting you all who are here in the audience and then see if some on Zoom will um, give us questions. So um, hold on to your hat and see if you can pull, pull out one question from all that we've just heard. And there are, there are mics here. Uh, come on up. Do you want to come ask a question? It's a very gregarious go. group, but they're quiet. Marianne. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you. This was so beautiful, such a beautiful story and so beautifully told and really inspiring. I sort of got stuck in the beginning when you talked about silence. Uh -huh. And I wanted to hear more about the practice of silence, why it was bad for his mental health, how... Um, people who are poets and activists can um, live in silence. I've always been very intrigued by that. So I was wondering if you could tell us more about that and then about the practice of daily writing that you then evoke um, toward the end of the lecture and how those things sit together. Thank you, Marianne. Um, well, I think, I think that you know, reading the letters of Cardinal, his reflection on his time at Gethsemane uh, and Merton's response to it, Merton and the doctors both felt that it was too stressful for him. And part of it is that the Trappists work physically very hard. They have this enormous, they grow enormous amounts of food and they sell it. And um, so it's a lot of hard labor. I think Cardinal also had anxiety just in general. And he, even later, he is always writing about his stomach problems and his, so he, you know, I, I mean, really, these are people suppressing an enormous amount in their daily life. I mean, especially men, the two of them, I think truly love women, honestly. And the, the thing, I mean, Cardinal's poems are full of reflection on these wonderful women he knew when he was young. So they're repressing an awful lot and they're trying to live a life which, they're hoping will elevate their consciousness, that living that very austere contemplative life and the silence, which is so interesting because they own, they have a sign language that they use, the Trappist, but they're really not supposed to engage at all um, and to really be in a way cut off from each other in that verbal way. So I think, you know, I've always believed that if you wanna act in the world, and Merton believes this, and if you, any of you are interested, his Asian journals are full of this. I mean, 
you really need to transform yourself first. And that is really Merton's sense that you can't probably be effective unless you have really come to a kind of peace within yourself and then you radiate peace. And he struggled his whole life with that and never felt he'd gotten there. Mm. And I think that at the end, if you read the Asian journals, I found it fascinating. He becomes so, he's so close to Buddhism that it's unclear what would have happened had he lived mm. after that trip. Like if he would have stayed in the monastery or if he would have transformed himself in terms of becoming more of a Buddhist. He was trying very hard to integrate it all, but he knew that to get to a very deep part of the self, you really needed that quiet and you needed that silence and you needed to be apart from the world. So everyone who has a practice of meditation knows that, but when you are someone like Merton, everything Merton is extreme. I mean, the productivity, the amount of, right? It's just unbelievable, the two of them, the amount of writing they produced just alone, if, you, if they did nothing else in life, would have been extraordinary. Um, but to write like that, to think like that, to go deep like that, to be such a seeker as Merton was, and as Cardinal was, I think there was a lot of strain. And they were very, very distressed with the external world. They were very distressed by popular culture, that the noise of popular mm. culture and the influence of American popular culture around the world and what it was doing to um, a different kind of consciousness. So I think they lived they lived with these strains all the time. And But out of those strains come amazing writers and amazing artists. That's always been true. If one had a simple way through life, probably wouldn't feel this need to externalize it as much as they did in writing for them. And also Cardinal as a sculptor, Merton also took a lot of photographs. I mean, they were very interested in, they were just interested in form and in art and culture and how it all fit together and how it fit together with religion. How does it fit together with transforming society? So they came here to do certain tasks in this life, I think, and um, miraculously sort of found each other. But, you know, Merton's correspondence is unbelievable with so many people. Cardinal is just one of them, but I became particularly interested in them because of their past as writers. Just found that so interesting. And also because I knew Cardinal, I had some sense of him. So when I, when I thought, oh my God, how could that be that I never knew that when I saw these letters? I, I, I mean, so thank you to the Rare Book Collection at Columbia for doing such a wonderful exhibit. I get a shout out to them. I don't know, Marianne, did I answer that for you? Thank you. Others of you here? Yes, there's a call. Please. Suzanne, oh, well, you know what, it? you have it, so you ask your question and then they'll be next. Um, I uh, thank you so much. It was really wonderful. Also, to talk to the mic because it's recording. It's on. Okay. Uh, can you? Is that right? Uh, thank you. It was great reminded of, of those times in Chicago. But my question really has to do with Cardinal as someone who uh, was a spouse revolution, lived it, sacrificed for it, and then lived to see it turn into another repression. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if he talked about that with Merton or whether he addressed that in this, if there's a sense of how he processed that a dissolute. Well, Merton dies, not before, Merton dies before all that happens. So there isn't that correspondence, but um, I think that Cardinal, you know, I think that he was very frightened for his own life. Mm. Um, and I think that, but he couldn't, abide that he'd been part of a, the Sandinistas and a revolutionary government that became so authoritarian and repressive. And just a few months ago, there was an article about the Sandinistas murdering and locking up radical priests. So they continued to be oppressive and it's a, a terrible thing to have had such a belief in something that you were willing to actually go against your very deep belief in pacifism to be part of what became quite bloody revolution mm. and then see it turn into something completely the opposite. But I think that, you know, this is where the visionary art part comes in, is that if you have that part of yourself and you can dream that way, then you can dream beyond that too. And mm. you can say, well, there was this moment. And, and we see that with many revolutionary societies, we can name them all. Um, there's a moment when it matches the ideal. But mm. and then and then when it transforms, it's very painful. But mm. you hope for the next 
revolutionary idea. But I also believe that when ideas are enter into a society or enter into the global society, they never really leave. So there's a, there's a dream still to be fulfilled. I mean, we could talk about the Cuban revolution in ways too, you know, the, what became repressive and broke our hearts. We can talk about China that way. I mean, yeah. those of us yeah. who were young during all of this and really believed, but it doesn't make us less utopian thinkers in a bad, in the good way of utopian thinking. It doesn't change the ability to imagine. That's the creative part of mm. everything. Yeah. Thank you. The there's a question on somebody up there was yes, but this one just follows up. There's a question on Zoom that oh. follows up this conversation where someone just comments, wonderful lecture, thank you. Uh, a comment, this person says. A few years ago, speaking in Nashville, Cardinal was asked about his relationships with the Pope. His answer was, When I was in Kentucky, Thomas Merton was my Pope. <laughs> That's so nice. So isn't that a sense of reconstructing your life according to your ideals? I think it's a sense of um, always wishing and hoping that what we really believe deep, most deeply in can be embodied. Merton wasn't a saint. He would have been the first one to say, I'm not a saint. But for Cardinal, he embodied so much of what Cardinal aspired to when Cardinal was young and met Merton. and. He looked up to him always. So I think that's a wonderful comment. Mm -hmm. you know? Thank you. And uh, I think that the fact that Cardinal felt that France, that Pope Francis, the fact that he was elected to the uh, to become the Pope was a miracle mm. that he did, probably didn't expect to see in his lifetime. Yeah. Uh, please. Was, was Cardinal ever tempted to follow Merton into a contemplative religious life? You know, I don't know that. I mean, he didn't do that. He went and went to Mexico and, and was in a Benedictine monastery. And then he went and became a priest when he went back to Colombia and La Seca. I, I think that Cardinal was in the world in a way that Merton very young chose not to be. I, I, I don't think he wanted to leave that world entirely. I think he went to Gethsemane to become a priest. He didn't go to get somebody like Merton and Merton vowed to stay for his entire life. I mean, imagine he was young and he made that decision. You know, he was a student at Columbia. You know, that's, that's right. hard to even imagine, right? And then completely surprised his friends by having this religious conversion and then chooses one of the strictest orders imaginable to become part of, which is the Trappist. So, you know, where did that come from? I mean, but I don't think, I mean, I. I I don't know everything about Cardinal. I'm not an expert on either of them really, um, but I, I've never seen, I never saw anything where, it, certainly not in their correspondence, but Cardinal aspires to that. And obviously when he was, when he was at Gethsemane, it wasn't ideal for him, even though, as I said, wistfully, he remembers it as wonderful to live in that silence, but then it was making him sick. <laughs> but Merton really thought that that had a lot to do with him not being allowed to write. He could only write these kind of yeah. impression, these sort of journalistic impressions, but he wasn't allowed to be uh, a, a poet. So I think that we have several painters in the room and I'm thinking, you know, put them in a, a monastery in Gethsemane and tell them they can't paint and they'd probably get sick too, you know? Like people have these forms within which they embody uh, ideas and if you take them away, then it's very hard on them. And so I'm not, I, I don't think Cardinal aspired to that, but he did aspire to integrating all of these different philosophical forms and this cosmic consicle, which I didn't even know until I started all this, this op magnum opus of his later in life is an amazing, it's an amazing poem. It's this huge poem, which brings everything together that he knows in the universe. It's an incredible achievement. So he had big, just big, you know, big calling in so many ways and loved the world also. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there's a comment on Zoom about perhaps loving the world. Did Merton and Cardinal share a love for walking or walking meditation? As I understand, Merton was an avid walker in the woods. Yeah, there's a, if you read the um, journals, um, you will see just endless walks around Gethsemane. He loves the land. He loves 
the sunlight. He loves the trees. He loves the seasons. He revels in the birds. I mean, he's very much Franciscan in that way. Yeah. You know, he's like, he just loves nature and gets very, very upset when it's disturbed um, by developers and builders. And, you know, he really, oh. really wants to have this place to escape to. And so, yes, I, I think that's absolutely right. And, and of course, um, Cardinal completely falls in love with this archipelago yes. in Nicaragua yes. and begs Merton to come and just see how beautiful this is and to see what it's like to live in such an idyllic place. So yes, I think they're both very much engaged with nature, very much engaged with walking. Yes, yes. But also the embodied part of that yeah. aestheticism uh, is, is of interest. Um, other comments from here before I turn to more Zooms? Are we good? Uh, another, let's let's try at least one more. Uh, this this some of you may know the answer to. It's a funny uh, it's a funny question. Who were the professors Merton and Cardinal yeah. studied with at Columbia? Mm -hmm. Anybody know? Yeah, he um he was Lionel Trilling. Uh, well, there you go. Um, Mark Van Dorn. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to remember. There's a whole list of them that he stayed close to, and of course. He is um, becomes very good friends with Robert Giroux, yeah. who's then Farage ah, Strauss right, Giroux, right, right, right. who publishes all his early books, even mm -hmm. when no one else can see what they're going to become, like Seven Story Mountain, he publishes them. So his friendships, and he, he stays very close to poet Robert Lax, who ends up living in a very remote island in Greece. But they're all in correspondence for their ho the whole time of Merton's life. They are. Yeah. So and Merton really was a, a, a student of literature when yeah, he was at Columbia. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I found it. I mean, one of the things I see Jennifer's here. I mean, one of the amazing things I learned from Jennifer's amazing exhibition um, was that um, Merton was the editor of a humor magazine. That really surprised me. But then the more I learned about Merton, the more I found out he was actually very funny and had a great sense of humor. Mm. But I, I wouldn't have. I would never have known that. You know. But to be a and that's where he makes these very deep friendships is when he starts writing and becoming an editor. And those friends are his friends for his entire life. He stays close to them forever till the very end. Huh. And their writing correspondence is for his whole life. Huh. So, so that then, I mean, speaks to the real central overwhelming paradox of how does this activism, the, 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 the Marxism, the activism, the revolutionaryism, and the mystical religiosity cohabit. <laughs> and even just what you said, he was funny, and yet he stops. The Dalai Lama is really funny. Have you ever seen the Dalai Lama in person? He's outrageously funny. He makes, like, I, I was sort of an event with him with in, at DePaul University in Chicago, kind of small event. And he was all these priests on, this, on the podium with him, and they were all very austere. And the Dalai Lama is, like, lying down oh. practically, and you know, he's scratching his head. He's, like, completely relaxed. And he's funny, and he's kind of laughing with, you know, trying to get them to be funny, but they're not funny. No, but I no. think that often very evolved beings are funny too. And I, I think for me, I don't know, for me, there's no contradictions in this. I just Good. see it. I see all of it coming together. The, the problem for many people and is that it, it requires you to open your consciousness to all of these possibilities that can coexist. And yeah. I think what we're trained to do is really compartmentalize so many things that by the time we're adults, we don't know how to break down all those barriers. Yeah. And our institutional structures reflect that. Yes. You know, they're not fluid. We've talked about that <laughs> together about universities. They're not fluid. So everything is put into these boxes. And then it's very difficult for people to say, well, all these contradictory forces can coexist. They can be very powerful. And if you can embody them, then you can create art, you can create writing, you can create music, you can create other forms in which all of those things can come together and coexist. So to me, there's a great optimism in that. Yes. And that, in conclusion, is why we invited Carol Becker to come <laughs> give our days this thing. Thank you. Thank you.